Hi there, everyone. Hello. Hi. I think several people are still joining. Uh, I think we had nine people joining, originally 10. So, um, and let me see that I can share my screen. Yeah, that's down here. Okay, just checking off. It's, each system is different. So, Kelsey, uh, still, we're expecting nine people, correct? We'll give people a couple more minutes. Uh, Kelsey, did you send out already the PowerPoint and the cross brochure to everyone? I sent it to our list of registrants, so everyone should have that in their email from me. And then I usually wait a couple minutes, especially coming back from noon for a workshop to sure. make sure people can get in. Um, but otherwise, then you can start whenever you're ready. All right. Yeah, we'll wait a couple more minutes. Um, it's just one o'clock now, so we'll wait a couple more minutes. I'll test sharing my screen, so. All right. Oh, work that way. I can't advance it. Up oh, here. Okay. Yep. There we go. Awesome. While we wait, I'd be uh, curious, uh, the list that I received didn't say uh, where everyone is from. So I'd be curious to know what uh, schools or departments you have joined. So if you don't mind, uh, I was going to call out names and if you just give me, uh, let me know which school or department you joined. Um, Marai, do I, did I pronounce that correctly? Are you there? Nope. Okay. How about Eric? Hi. Yeah. Thank you for doing this. I'm uh, in the criminal justice program. So the department of human services. Oh, wonderful. So, you know, Phil Stinson then I take Yeah. It? Yeah. Very, very, yes, I do. <laughs> All right. He has had cross students before. Yes. Uh, yes. He has quite a few. Awesome. Awesome. Vamsi, did I say that correctly? Yes, you got it right. Uh, which department did you join or school? Uh, school of media and communication. Wonderful. Uh, Crystal? I'm in arts and sciences in the forensic science program. Oh, wonderful. Yes, we've had students from there in the past, but not recently participating. So that's awesome. Uh, Matt, I know you, but how about you introduce yourself for everyone else? Uh, yeah, hi, I'm uh, in biology. Um, I'm sorry, I'm in my car. What was the question? <laughs> what area you in biology but i know you because you also run the marine lab so oh yes yep yep so i've always had a lot of students asking me to do some kind of project with them and all right and you got my email from earlier today about your application oh yes i did wonderful yep, thank you wonderful uh and the only one we haven't heard from was uh Mariah. if if you at any point uh, are able to speak uh, let me know uh, which area you're from that's actually, that's actually me as well. It's uh, that's 
Oh. That's a lot. It, it's, it's my, that's on my desktop at home. I'm just dropping a, a, one of my daughter's off. It's, uh, <laughs> okay, that would explain so, a lot. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's all right. That's no worries. Um, is that how her name is pronounced? Uh, her name is, is Marae. Marae. Okay. All right. Thank you. Just was curious. All right. And Kelsey, if anyone else, uh, if they would like a repeat of this, I don't mind repeating it. We can offer this very regularly. Um, I have no problems with current or new faculty. Um, if there is a demand, I'm happy to do this like once a month. I already have the slides prepared, so it's not really any extra work for me in that sense. It's just a matter of people signing up. So I know one uh, one uh, faculty member contacted me and said he wasn't able to join, and he asked me whether I could uh, repeat this or uh, speak with him separately. So I already have emailed him and asked him. Uh, uh, I already asked him uh, that would give me a time, and I'd be happy to meet with him separately. So um, I think we will get started. So I need to see how I can minimize that so I can see things good uh, please at any point in time uh, feel free to interrupt uh, and ask questions uh, Matt some of this should be familiar to you but if you have any specific questions please uh, do not hesitate also to ask because it might be a question that I may not have thought of that uh, or information that I might have not thought to include in the slides at this point um, I, I wanted to give a very quick background, uh, just so that pe people usually get confused by my accent. And, and I also wanted to give you a background where I'm coming from. So I'm originally from München, which uh, you know is Munich in Germany. Uh, but I obtained my bachelor's, master's and PhD at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. I always loved biology. Um, that was my area of interest right from the beginning. And I eventually specialized in neuroscience. Uh, specifically, I worked with in animal navigation. I studied how um, animals navigate, uh, what sensory cues they use, and how that information is processed in the brain. And very specifically, I was interested in how animals sense the earth magnetic field and how they navigate. And I did research in that area for about 15 years. Uh, and I was a member of the psychology department at BGSU for several years, uh, where I came in with some NSF funding. And I had several course students when I was actively doing research at the time. Uh, and then I became the director of CURS in 2014. And the mission that I was given straight up right away was to expand CURS to all disciplines. Uh, in, his, in the historical background of CURS was that it was STEM disciplines only. It was run part time by various faculty members over the years. And it was supposed to provide uh, some funding so that uh, faculty members would take on undergraduate students. Uh, to work with them in research as opposed to just working with graduate students, which was more common back then. So uh, over the last eight years, I have expanded CURS really to all disciplines. Uh, some are more active in it than others, um, though my goal is always to expand into all schools and departments, all colleges. And uh, sometimes more, sometimes some areas are more active with CURS students and then less active than that if that faculty member retires or leaves. So it, it varies, but, but my goal is always to have uh, faculty members and students participate from all areas uh, on campus. So this is not STEM only at all. So I want to stress that right at the beginning. So if you're not STEM, which several of you are not, um, this is for everyone. So obviously you're going to be a very, very busy faculty member. I totally understand that. I, I know what it's like having been faculty myself. Um, so the question is, why should you do research scholarly or creative projects with undergraduate students? And that's a fair enough question. So I always pose that same question to the students, too, when I give them presentations. You know, why should you be doing it? And I actually will start quickly with what your students will gain out of this. Most of you will probably already have an idea about this, but I just want to quickly remind you that these projects are incredibly valuable to students. Uh, they, they build general uh, professional skills. They build discipline related skills. It teaches students, you know, show up on time, do the things you agreed to do, communicate. But they also learn skills that are related specifically for their discipline. Uh, they gain, of course, presentation experience because they will be required to give a presentation at the end of the project unless they graduate uh, the December beforehand. They are required to give a presentation in the spring. Uh, they're, if they graduate, they're welcome to give a presentation, but they're not required. 
they, they do need to develop communication skills. And part of the pedagogy of this uh, grant system is that they already with the application, starting with the application process, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later, um, that they will develop the communication skills to actually effectively communicate what they want to do and why and why it should be funded. And then when they have done the work, you know, what did they find? What are the outcomes of the project? Um, what uh, p um, product was produced in some disciplines? What uh, knowledge was gained? So learning communication skills. They do learn to work independently or as part of a team that really, or both, that depends really on the project. Uh, because this covers all disciplines on campus, of obviously the type of projects are incredibly varied. Uh, they, their goal is also for them to develop critical and constructive thinking skills. So not just, you know, to uh, do what they're told, but also think about why they're doing it and whether there might be a better way of doing it and to critically analyze whatever they see or find or develop. Uh, they will obtain reference letters from any faculty mentors they do a project with. And that is incredibly valuable to them later on. Uh, a detailed faculty mentor letter that can gush about them, is how I always put it, can really open doors, both for graduate school or for dream jobs. So these reference letters are very, very valuable to them. They're able to build their resume. So the uh, presentation they give, the project they do, the grant they get, all these things can be listed on a resume. Some of these undergraduate students also end up as co-authors and publications. Again, something they can list on their resume. And students really should try and develop their resume as widely as they can, as, as, make it as long as they can while they're at BGSU. Uh, because I always tell the students, there are lots of other people with the same degree and the same GPA or higher than you. Uh, so you have to stand out. And this is the kind of thing that will make you stand out. Uh, students get the opportunity to participate in networking uh, through their mentor. Um, a lot of mentors take them to events, conferences, exhibitions, performances, competitions. And so that's a wonderful opportunity for them not only to present their work, but also to network. Obviously, they also can network through the mentor. That's, again, extremely valuable for them because the mentors are ahead in their careers and compared to the student and therefore know people and are able to tell them what are important things to do next as the next steps in for, these, for that career choice. Uh, and also students, uh, these projects allow students to develop a peer support system uh, with other fellow students uh, that are roughly the same year or slightly ahead of them. And a peer support system is extremely important for the future for them as well. Uh, I'm personally still friends with uh, people that I went to university with and I always tell the students those relationships uh, over the years uh, in your career as well as your personal life as you hit various milestones are incredibly helpful. And a lot of these um, friendships form during uh, time at university. I'm sure you've all experienced that yourself. So I always remind the students that they should actively develop a peer network system as well as a mentor network system. Uh, any questions so far? Please do not be afraid to interrupt me at any point in time. So I know I talk fast, but if anything's unclear, please uh, let, let me know. I'm happy to backtrack and elaborate or explain. Um, on the flip side, what will you gain as a mentor? Um, so I always like to say cloning is not yet an option. And when I was doing my own active research agenda, um, I got a lot more achieved by involving undergraduate students. Uh, you, uh, faculty are very, very busy on so many fronts. And while it takes time to invest in undergraduate students to work with you, uh, if you train them well, uh, you can really accomplish a great deal more. Uh, you will find that some students are more apt than others and those who are less apt will usually eventually, you know, they might do one project and then leave, but you might, you may find that you have students who will do repeat projects with you with or without course fundings and students are allowed to apply repeatedly. Uh, at this point, we have not limited that. We've never had a student who excessively applied, so it has never been an issue. Uh, but many students do more than one project. So if you train students, uh, you may find that you have a student that will stick with you for several years and those students become extremely valuable to your own agenda, whatever that may be research wise or scholarly. Um, I will talk a little bit more about it later, uh, but I will tell you that I had one student, she stayed with me from sophomore year all the way until the end of her master's and she was working at the level of a graduate student already by her junior year and she was really fantastic and with her help we got a lot of research accomplished and, and publications done. So can be very valuable to you. Uh, typically mentors who enjoy mentoring feel satisfied mentoring, especially those students that, that really stand out. It's, it's a wonderful personal experience. 
you see them grow and help them along in their career. You will also gain new, purpose, gain new perspectives yourself because you will have someone else who can obviously give you have give you a different perspective. Uh, uh, and I found that in my own research often very valuable using students as sounding boards. Uh, you will develop leadership skills, which will be good for you professionally yourself, obviously. And you learn also to enhance your communication skills. It's very important with students to be very straight up what will be done, how it will be done, when it will be done, and to make sure communication works obviously both ways and to establish that early on. You'll be learning more about yourself, again, as well as your own, own research. Just working with a multitude of people ultimately will enrich your own research and scholarly agenda. It will help you develop your own network because these students will eventually become professionals and, and will become part of your network, not all of them, but some. And it will help you obviously also develop your professional portfolio because if you have course students, you can list that on, on your po uh, portfolio with your school or your department. So when it comes to time for tenure evaluation, that can definitely be very helpful. It's a time investment and I don't, I wouldn't suggest you take just on any student. You do need to screen them, but uh, most students that approach me for funding and, and or approach you will be students that are dedicated and interested. They, they don't tend to be students that are not, uh, typically. Um, so when or can or should students start? We always tell them that your time for them to start conducting research scholarly or creative projects is in their sophomore year. We have some that are super eager and super organized who will start before then. They will arrive in the fall semester and they will apply at the end of the fall semester for their first project in the spring as a freshman. Those are not very common, but they do happen. Most of them will get settled during their freshman year and then apply in the spring semester of their freshman year for their first grant in, in their, at the start of their sophomore year. We do not encourage them to apply for a summer project unless they already very uh, into it and, and show that potential because our summer projects, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later, they're more in depth and they're larger projects. And I don't, unless it's a student that is very talented already in that area and very uh, organized and, and keen, I would not recommend that they do a summer project first. It, they would be better off to start off with a spring or fall project uh, is, is the more typical route that people take. Most importantly, they should not wait until they've finished half of their major to get involved. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's sad when students come to me as a junior or senior and where I say, well, I wish you would have uh, come to me earlier, but we still have time. But if they start as a sophomore, they really have opportunity to do multiple projects and really build that resume and that skill set. Uh, so that's why we encourage them to start early on. But on the flip side, you know, we don't want them to get involved unless they're ready. They should make sure that they take their schedule in consideration and to allow them a transition, if, especially if they live away from home for the first time. Um, that first semester can be uh, quite a new experience for them. So we, we, we do encourage students to keep that in mind on the flip side. Now, when, when or should you as mentors start? Well, uh, except for Matt, uh, if you are a new faculty, um, you know, it's really when your research scholarly or creative agenda is ready to receive assistance, because this is a two way street. Uh, you are supposed to get something out of this too. Unfortunately, we do not have a stipend for, for mentors as such. Uh, though I will add here on the side note, and I didn't include it in the slides, that we are working to develop QREs, which are course-based undergraduate research experiences. And for those, we will have uh, stipends for the mentors who will create such opportunities. But this is still in its infancy, so uh, this is not an official program yet. But as a mentor who works with students, you should get something out of it. And so therefore, you shouldn't start being a mentor until you're ready to receive that assistance from students. Um, it's, it's a point when there is basically there's a, when you're at the point when there is more work than, than that you could be doing than you could possibly physically do yourself. That's a good point. Uh, to start involving students. And in general, when you feel ready to be a mentor, when you are um, at that point where you would like to involve students and, and therefore broaden what goes on in your research scholarly or creative group. Uh, on the flip side, don't wait too long, obviously, because as I said earlier, it, it, it takes time to train a cohort of students and it will take time to, for you to gain experience being a mentor if you've never done that before. And you don't want to start out mentoring five students all at once. You, you want to start out perhaps with one or maybe two um, just to see how that goes so that you gain experience at being a good mentor. Uh, your your, your uh, 
group of students that will be working with you will grow naturally as you go along, uh, but you don't want to overwhelm yourself right at the beginning. And again, I want to say as a reminder, this is not just for STEM disciplines, this is for everyone. And obviously what kind of format these projects take will greatly de depend on what area, what discipline you are in. So how do students choose a project? Um, just to give you background, how, how this works from the student side. Uh, most students approach the faculty without having a particular project in mind. That's really important to know. Um, so therefore, most students will be end up being involved in a project that's close to a mentor's interest. Though when students approach me, I say I, I tell them to look at faculty uh, member websites and see what faculty teach, what they publish, what they're involved in. And then to uh, let me know what their top three mentors are that like to work with. But I will tell them that they have to research. They have to be, they don't want, I don't want them to approach a mentor and just say, well, I want to do research with you because your stuff sounds cool. Or I, I want to do a creative project with you because I love painting. I, I will tell them you have to be more specific than that. You have to say what, what specifically you're interested in that the mentor is involved in that draws you towards that mentor because they, and I always remind them that the mentor invests time in them. So they need to make sure that they do the legwork so that they are also going to be of value to the mentor. Uh, some students ha sometimes have a project in mind, but ultimately it's up to you as a mentor to assess the feasibility and provide advice. So for example, if a student says, I want to work with elephants at the zoo, um, then I would say, well, I will have to look closely into what's involved in getting that going because uh, you will need a whole bunch of permits to even get close to, to animals in the zoo. And uh, beside the fact that they might be uh, not taking on any projects that involve the animals at this point in time. So while you might have an eager student who has ideas, um, but it's ultimately you are the mentor, you are the expert to assess whether that's feasible and, and what is doable and to provide advice and guidance in that case. Um, most experienced mentors, as I mentioned beforehand, supervise more than one student project in a semester, uh, but that's not, not always the case. Um, I do have a number of mentors who regularly have labs or groups, scholarly groups or creative groups that are very active with multitude of students, some with CURS funding, some without. And I should stress here, a student can work with you without course funding as well. They don't need to have course funding in order to be allowed to work with you. It's just the course funding is a nice bonus because you get money and the student gets also to list that on their resume. So uh, it's, uh, so students uh, uh, can work with you anytime. Um, as I said, most experienced mentors therefore work with more than one student because it allows them to just simply get more done. Projects can be done individually or in small groups. Uh, up to five students is the maximum that we fund. Uh, beyond that, we feel it uh, becomes a project becomes unwielding. So typically anywhere between one and five students. Um, and as I said, many students do more than one project before they graduate. And some switch mentors to gain different skills. That's very common. And that's not something personal necessary against the mentor. They do that just to get different skills and to have different mentors as reference letters, um, but some stay with the same mentor for several years. Just like the student I mentioned earlier, she stayed with me for several years because she was very interested in what I was doing and she was able to work at a level that graduate students would be working at normally because she had so much experience by then. Both pathways are completely valid. Uh, and also I'd like to point out, because it's a topic that's dear to my heart that I also work on, is that students from underrepresented groups may, may need to be approached by the mentor. They don't always see themselves as being able to do a project with a mentor. It might not be on the horizon because they have not had a, had a role model before. And so they might, you might come across a brilliant student um, who you think would be wonderful to have in, in your group, um, but you may have to approach them. So please keep that in mind that you actively seek out students uh, and don't necessarily just wait for them to approach you because some students might not have the confidence or see themselves in that role, but would be very capable of, of doing a project and they would greatly benefit from it. Um, so how do students find a faculty mentor? And here the key is that they have to have a mentor before they can apply for a course grant. So they can't apply and then find a mentor. They have to have the mentor first. And I always tell them to reflect on their favorite classes and what topics they found interesting in those classes. 
I also tell them to review faculty websites to learn about what faculty members' interests and current projects are. So here, this is one of many reasons for you to keep your faculty member website up to date and, and have as much information there that allows students to see what you're doing and what you're interested in so that they may approach you. They can absolutely approach you directly. They do not have to go through me at all. Uh, and they may approach you and then ask you about what, what kind of opportunities you may have to work with uh, in, in your group. Um, but, but as I said before, when, if I get to talk to the student first, I will advise them to be specific, not just to say, like, I think your stuff is cool. I think they should be able to tell you more than that. And that's a good indicator for you to see whether that's a student uh, you might want to work with, because if they do that extra legwork, uh, then that's a student that's going to be eager and organized and and motivated and driven. That's the kind of student you especially want to work with. Though some students can learn to become that, I, I should add here. Uh, so you, you might want to give them a chance and see whether they, if you give them a task, you know, like, well, tell me why you want to work with me and see whether they, what they come back with. Uh, uh, students can also contact me and then I reach out to faculty members. Uh, I do that too. Um, it really depends on the situation. Uh, both paths, both ways are fine. Uh, some students are too shy to approach faculty members. Sometimes I help them, you know, with writing an email to the faculty member. Some fa faculty members require students to bang on their door and so to knock on their door and they will not respond to emails because they're popular mentors. And unless a student makes the effort to co actually come to their office, they won't even respond because they have already so many students who, who they work with. So they can get, they can be picky in that case. So, Again, I'll pause briefly, see any questions at this point in time before I move on to how this all works. All right. Um, so how do students apply for course fundings? Uh, students apply together with their mentor or mentors because we have some projects where we have two mentors. That is, especially in interdisciplinary projects, not uncommon. Uh, so we do have that. Oh, I have one thing in the chat. Let me quickly see whether I can see that. So the date, yes, I'm in the process of updating them right now. And I will also, uh, so the dates for the grants uh, will be disseminated in various forms. I put them in campus updates. I also email all faculty uh, and I will, uh, I have asked and I'm waiting for an updated list uh, of um, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, all the new faculty so that I can update my list. I also have faculty um, who uh, push not to be on the list. So if you get emails from me and you don't want to be on the list, please tell me and I'll remove you from the list and I'll do my best to keep the list up to date. Uh, so that's another way and they will be on the course website. I'm working right now with marketing but until my student starts, I can't update the website. So I'm working right now with marketing to update the dates, but there will be a second round of full grants. Um, it will be announced very shortly and will be the first few weeks of the semester. Uh, second question, do students attend the National Core Conference? Some do. Uh, we do not organize it. That's usually through um, their faculty mentor. Um, but we do have a travel grant, and I'll mention that a little bit later, where there's financial support. So yes, some students do attend the National Core Conference. All right. So they, as I said, they apply with their mentor for the funding because they have to have the mentor first. And the pedagogy of the course grant, is, the application is actually part of the pedagogy. Uh, ideally, the middle ground is with doing the application uh, is that you work with the student. You, you guide and supervise. We don't want you to write it for them, but we also don't want you to do a sink or swim approach because learning how to apply for funding is very crucial in pretty all disciplines. You've got to be able to say why someone should give you money and what you're going to do with it. And then when you've done the project, report out on what you did and what you achieved so that it might give you more money. So learning how to do all this is part of the pedagogy. So we want mentors to help uh, with that, um, but not do it for the student. And I absolutely can assist you and your students with the application process. So uh, even seasoned mentors will ask me sometimes questions if they're not sure about a particular aspect, but especially uh, someone who's never had a course student before, I'm very happy to meet one-on-one -on -one with you and uh, your student or students, uh, either virtually or in person, and we can talk through the application process. Usually I do it virtually or by email. Usually the questions they have are very specific, but I do have had also other faculty mentors who wanted to meet via Zoom or in person uh, and walk them again through the process. Always very happy to do that. Please do not hesitate to reach out. 
Um, the application is relatively straightforward. And anyone who has applied for, say, NSF or NIH funding will find this, of course, much simpler. Um, but it mirrors the same concept. Uh, the students will fill out, uh, with your assistance, an online form. It's not very long. Information about the student, information about you, uh, what's the name of the project, what's an abstract, what you're planning to do, how much money do you ask for. It's not, it's not very long. Uh, they're also supposed to submit at the end of the form three files. One is a project narrative, which is basically the written proposal. What's the background? What's the research or scholarly question? And for those who do creative projects, there has to be a scholarly question attached to it. It cannot be, and I'll say this in quotation marks, just a piece of art or music. Uh, while that is, of course, a wonderful achievement, we do want a scholarly question attached with it. Um, how is this, what's the student planning to do to answer that research or scholarly question? Uh, what do they expect to find? And how does it fit into the larger concept of, of the discipline? They're supposed to submit a proposed budget. This is typically not very long, usually a few lines in Excel or Word outlining what the money specifically will be spent on with individual costs as well as um, total amount requested. Uh, students do not have to ask for project funding. I will stress that because some disciplines like computer science, we have found they have everything they need. They don't need any, they don't need funding for the project, they, but the student would like to be able to participate for the experience and to be able to list it on their resume and to get their stipend. And I'll talk about that in a moment, how much these are. Uh, and they need a faculty mentor letter of support. If it's more than one mentor, they may submit up to two. Uh, letters of support and they will be also they're also part of the reviewing process so um, I will talk about that in a moment uh, here is an overview of our grants so, um, we have uh, three uh, different types of semester grants so right now we don't have a winter session so that is at the moment on hiatus until we have again a winter session if ever I don't know what the plans are there, but I keep it on the list. Um, but typically we have full spring and summer right now. So these are project grants. So these are for doing a project with a faculty mentor. The student would be working a few hours a week for several weeks, uh, typically 10, uh, 10 weeks for fall and spring, and 23 hours per week for 10 weeks in the summer. Uh, project costs, we fund up to $500 for fall and spring as well as summer though um, actually what i need to add in the next version of this presentation is uh, if the if you have a group of students of three to five students then we give up to 750 dollars so if there's if there are more students three to five students then you can ask up to 750. again a student can also ask for zero that's perfectly okay um, stipends, each student gets the same stipend, so stipends in the fall and spring are typically $200 at the end of the project, and in the summer it's up to $2,500. Uh, it depends really on the number of applications that we get. Uh, we had this past summer a very, very high caliber group of applications, and I obviously have some limitations in the funding that I get given to hand out. When that happens is we usually get very creative about creating, uh, based on the ranking after review, a, a, a tier system where we have the top top students being funded fully and then the second tier students being funded partially. So that's why I will say, um, I'll say a stipend up to 2,500, that's the typical one, but if we have an extremely large number of high caliber applications, we want to fund as many students as we can, so we usually work out a system so that we can fund as many as possible without the students, uh, especially the, the top applications, being penalized at all or, or um, by the fact that there's so many good applications uh, or um, uh, that, that they don't have so little that it doesn't work for them. So we, we usually try to balance that. Now, we also have travel grants. Now, these are for presentations, performances, exhibitions, and competitions. There's obviously no project costs, and it works on a reimbursement basis. So to answer that question earlier, so students to attend uh, the National Kirk Conference to present, they, and they have to present, they can't just attend. So any student who participates, wants to have a travel grant, has to give a presentation, uh, or do a performance, participate in an exhibition or a competition. And they get up to $200 reimbursement of any costs that were associated with, with these activities. So 
travel costs, accommodation costs, if they have to sign up for professional uh, society in order to be presenting at this event, um, registration costs, all of these are, um, are eligible for reimbursement. All right. Uh, we have uh, a project review uh, system where we have other faculty members participating. And I know one of you has reached out already to me asking whether they could become a reviewer. And I absolutely always love to expand my reviewer base <coughs> for two reasons. I like to be projects be reviewed as closely as possible by someone in the same area, but obviously people can't review their own students. So um, I like to have more than one reviewer um, in each area. Uh, each project is reviewed by two or three faculty members and we calculate an average of the uh, of their scores uh, and uh, that will then determine how they were ranked and who's funded. More, some rounds are more competitive than others. We've had one summer round where almost everyone was 90 out of 100 above on average. Um, so that's what I was saying where we really tried very hard to fund all these awesome projects. So if you're interested in becoming a, re a reviewer, please let me know and I'll be very happy to meet with you and go over the details what that involves. And the person who's reached out to me already, um, I think I already responded to, so we can definitely chat about that. As I said, I love to have uh, a good number of reviewers and actually by being a reviewer, it gives you insight into, the, into how this works at a level uh, that is very helpful for your own applications. But you will never be asked to review your own applications, obviously. <clears throat> Each project um, is 10 weeks during the semester I'm very, very generous with extensions when needed. I do need the mentor to confirm and give a good reason uh, why an extension is needed. But if it's something that's beyond the control of the student and or mentor, um, I, I'm very happy to give extensions uh, and very generous extensions, uh, sometimes into the, the next semester or beyond the next semester. It depends really on the project and the reason. Um, because the goal is ultimately for us to make students able to do these projects. So if there's something beyond their control, we don't want to penalize them uh, by, by cutting off their, their project early um, for, for whatever the problem is, is uh, causing the delay. Um, students don't get their stipend until the project though is finished. So if they have an extension, they don't get their stipend until the end of that. Uh, summer ones are slightly different. Summer ones are paid out in installment and they don't get their last installment until the project is finished. Um, but we really just want to make it possible for students so that they, they, they can do the project if at all possible. Uh, let's see. Yes, and students are required to give a presentation on their project uh, during the spring semester unless they graduated in December, as I said earlier. So that's the opportunity to practice their presentation skills in a friendly environment. They obviously can list this presentation on their resume. And at the end of the project, they have to complete four report files with, again, the guidance of the mentor. Again, we don't want you to let them sink or swim, and we don't want you to uh, do it for them. Because again, that's, that's part of the pedagogy. If students have an extension, then these report files are not due until one week after their new extension date. Otherwise, they're typically due one week after the 10 week project period. Uh, for report files, pretty straightforward. Um, oh, I have a question, let me check. So that's a very good question. So can students reapply for a stipend in the spring if the original project uh, stipend starts in the fall and is extended in the spring? We cannot have them do effectively two projects at the same time. Their project has to be concluded uh, before they can apply for new project funding because they technically can't work on two projects at the same time. If it's the same project, then my advice would be to that student, let's conclude your project now um, at the end of the fall semester and give me your report files based on how far you've gotten. The report files do not require the students to have finished the project. It just would then be a reflection of where are we at right now? How, how far did we get in the project? Often adjustments have to be made, timelines have to be adjusted. So if they want to conclude the project, do the report files, and then they would give a presentation up to that point uh, in the spring. But if they then continue the project in the spring with new funding, and it, they can, of course, continue it also without course funding. So let me just say that. Um, then they, they could apply again for the spring. Absolutely, if they conclude it at the end of the fall, same project can be a continuation. 
And if they gain enough uh, new uh, information during that second semester, they can give two presentations in, in the spring. But if it makes more sense to combine the data or findings or scholarly work or creative work into uh, with a scholarly question, in the case of creative work, into one presentation, that is also absolutely access acceptable. And we really let mentors have a say in that, obviously, because it's different from each discipline and depends from project to project. Whatever makes logically sense is usually what, what we try to do. So hopefully that answered your question. Um, so there are four report files. One is basically the project narrative, but now updated with what the student actually did do and what they did find and what are the data or the scholarly findings or what was the creative part that was done and how did it answer the scholarly question. So it's basically reporting on what the project found, uh, what the results are. Let me check question. Um, no, the uh, conference presentations do not require reviews. Uh, we have posters and we have PowerPoint presentations. I'll cover that in a moment because I'll talk about the event. And no, they do not require reviews. We basically, because we have students apply with their mentor's consent, so to speak, we uh, and support, we assume that the mentor has vetted uh, that the student uh, is presenting. If they have had cross, and these are open to everyone, and I'll cover that in a moment, um, these are open to all students, um, and if they're cursed students, we already assume that the mentor has worked with them so that they can present it, at the minimum preliminary findings. So we, there is no review of, of the presentations as such. Every student who would like to present can present. Um, the second report file is a project reflection. Each, if there's a group, then the first, third, and fourth uh, file can be done as a group file, but the project reflection is done individually by the students. We want them to reflect for a page or so about what went well with the project, what went wrong, what were issues encountered, what were problems, how did they overcome them. We just really want them to reflect on the experience. Uh, financial disclosure statement is basically the budget updated what was actually spent, and that's also important because any unf unspent funds have to be returned to course. So I need students to be able to list, uh, you know, what were the individual expenditures with individual costs and what was the total spend. Again, we don't really want your department uh, to do that for them. Some departments have administrative assistants who keep track of all the funding, but we do want the students to, even if the administrative uh, person helps them or you help them, we don't want it to be done for them because keeping track of money spent is actually an important part of having a grant. And this is again part of the pedagogy. Um, PowerPoint presentation is the last one. We want them to do about 10 to 12 slides um, aimed at a general educated audience on their project as if they were gift presentation. And these files also help the students, for example, if they have a full grant um, if, and they're not presenting until the following spring or they had a summer grant and they're not presenting until the following spring. It helps them already put everything in place at the end of their project while it's still fresh in their mind. So they don't have to later go like, well, where are my files and where are my, my graphs and what did I do again then? So it, it really allows them to put everything in a format that allows them to very quickly to convert it to a PowerPoint or post a presentation when the time comes. It also allows them obviously to give presentation ex externally on their work as well. So, the, so these report files are not only for us to make sure that actually the project happened, but it's also a way to help the students be prepared and, and it's part of the pedagogy of reporting out to be prepared for future presentations, um, as well as, you know, to report out on findings like they would do with, a, with an agency and uh, outside academia. <clears throat> so any other questions for the moment before I move on to speaking about what events we have. All right, Eric, yes. Hi, thank you so much. So just a question about the, the stipends and kind of timing with everything. Um, when thinking about like in the in the CJ program and kind of the research that we do with with human subjects going one through the IRB um, as well as collecting that data can take a pretty considerable amount of time a semester maybe even a year. How can we kind of you know, and I'd want the student to get paid through that entire process of say it does take an entire academic year, not to mention writing it up and then getting into publication and things like that. Um, how can that, I guess, how can I kind of streamline that process to make sure that they're, you know, continuing to get paid, even if this does end up taking a longer period of time? 
<clears throat> yes, uh, so I will add here, I'm on the IACA committee, so I'm on the Animal Care and Use Committee because of my own research with animals uh, on campus. So I've been on that committee for probably 12 years now, uh, quite a while. Um, and I'm also familiar uh, with the human subjects one. And yes, that's absolutely true that sometimes it can take a while to, to get these permits. And what I have done in the past, I've been very flexible with end dates of projects in that case because we understand that that's outside the control to some degree of even the faculty mentor to get sometimes these approvals done. We encourage students, for example, to do also preliminary work before they would be working directly with the human subjects. Um, so <clears throat> they can get started on the project. We also encourage the faculty mentor to maybe uh, adjust the project if needed. But on the flip side, if their project was funded, but they're really having trouble securing that uh, stipend, uh, sorry, securing that approval, then we don't want the student to miss out. So we are, as I said, very generous with extensions as needed. Uh, I had one group that applied for the current summer grant project <clears throat> and they had a real difficulty getting that um, approval to work with the human subject. So they didn't actually start it all throughout the summer. And I said, to, and then as they reapplied in the fall semester, and I said to them, well, look, you were approved for the summer one. They applied before while this was all going on uh, and I said to them even if you get funded in the fall one you're better off with the funding that you're getting to keep your summer one you that they, they had to commit to a certain number of hours <clears throat> they were in the second tier so they weren't required to work the full 23 hours a week for 10 weeks <clears throat> because it was a second tier tier funding because they ranked lower um, and I said to them, as long as you, as the mentor and the students commit and that they still work those number of hours spread out throughout the semester, keep your summer funding because you have a bigger stipend that way. And you were already granted it and approved. So, but you, your project got delayed. So as I, said, we, I really try to work with the mentors and the students to enable students to do the projects wherever possible when there are things that are outside their control. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, that does. Thank you so much. That's, that's very helpful. Yeah, our goal is to help the students and the mentors. I mean, they, the students have to put the work in. So, for example, if they would have said, we can't work that number of hours um, in the fall semester for other reasons, then I would have said, okay, well, then we'll, um, you will def we'll, uh, not have the summer grant, we'll retract the summer grant, and you will go into the full grant round. And if you're funded, then you will have those requirements because the summer grants because the stipend is so much bigger they are required to work a larger number of hours in the fall and uh, spring it's under the mentor i don't keep track of hours in the fall and the spring it's under the mentors uh supervision basically that they work sufficiently on it but we only expect a few hours a week simply because they only get a 200 hundred dollar stipend and they have their classes so um then it's under their mentors guidance really but in the summer we do ask the mentors that they keep track that they make sure that they work the required numbers of hours so <clears throat> we Perfect. really want students to be able to do the project so we try to be flexible where where, where at all possible uh, i see that Thank there's you. another question so if a student has not received funding for a project or stipend that is if the student works voluntarily without any funding can they present at the conference yes so um the all these events and the first three are hosted by CURS. Um, and the fourth one is hosted by CURS if we're the host institution because it rotates. Um, <clears throat> so any student, any topic uh, for the spring one, hang on, one more question, let's see. Great, great, wonderful. So, um, yes, <clears throat> so you do not, students do not have to have CURS funding to present at these events. These are open to all students that qualify. And by qualify, I mean as uh, the spring one, the one that's mid-April, is undergraduate students only. The others two are undergraduate and graduate students of the three course events um, that are uh, on site. And, and the Northwest Ohio Undergraduate Symposium is on site if we're the host institution. It's basically our spring symposium except that we have students from other universities in the Northwest Ohio area participate as well. It doesn't look otherwise any different than what we normally do in mid-April. It's just that we have now external students participating. And actually, even when we're not host institutions, we've had students from Toledo 
and other institutions are sometimes can be present and i'm say sure the more the merrier i see no downside on on more students presenting so but if we're the host institution then we get a, a good number of students from other institutions participating so um I just want to quickly walk through the three types of events that we have. So <clears throat> the first one is the Embracing Global Engagement Conference, always held around mid-October. I'm right now in the process of um, finalizing the, the time and date with the room booking. And the uh, it's open to undergraduate and graduate students. And the topic can be anything that's related to either to a study abroad program or a topic that was done on campus that's intercultural, global, international in nature. So as, as soon as it is uh, anything in that area, the student can present. The second event is the Symposium on Diversity, which is always held in early December. Undergraduate and graduate students can participate, and it's really any topic related to diversity issues, not just the traditional topics you'd think about, but also socioeconomic uh, status. Um, so for example, food insecurity is something that's often presented on. Um, disability, um, age-related topics, uh, anything, really anything related to diversity in the broadest sense. And again, if a faculty mentor puts their name with the student when they apply that to present, then we assume that the mentor is working with the student uh, to, to give that presentation, to make sure that they're ready to give a presentation. They have to have a mentor related to the project, either in class or outside of class, in order to present. And the Symposium on Diversity has also uh, students presenting uh, um, within the cl uh, fr from course-based projects, uh, as well as projects that are mentored outside the classroom. So we have for that both course-based as well as outside classroom work. <clears throat> but again, they have to have always a mentor associated with any presentation. <clears throat> and then the undergraduate Symposium for Research or Scholarship, and I sometimes refer to that as Spring Symposium because it's, the, the name is a bit of a mouthful, um, that is always in mid to April. It's undergraduate students only, any topic. Uh, so anyone across campus can present. And um, students whose topic fits, not only, obviously everyone can present in April, but if they have a topic that fits one of the other two events or possibly uh, both of the other two events, they theoretically can give three presentations. So, and they're highly welcome to do so. We do encourage that because it gives the students more opportunity to practice their presentation skills. And if they especially can slightly tweak the focus of the presentation, they can also have different titles in their resume for the presentations that looks even better. And as I mentioned, the Northwest Ohio Undergraduate Symposium for Research and Scholarship is, is a rotating uh, a regional event, and we've hosted it twice before. It's undergraduate students only, again, any topic, any discipline. Uh, and when we are hosting, then uh, it's nothing different from what we normally do, except that we have students from other institutions participate. Uh, if it's hosted elsewhere, we organize typically, if there's the demand, a bus to take students to it. And we strongly encourage students to present at the other institutions, who at, at the other institution, whichever institution in the area is hosting it, uh, because it allows them, again, additional presentation experience, and they most certainly can list that on their resume, which looks great. So, <clears throat> let me go back one more time. So, um, any questions on these events at this point? All right. Our goal is for the students to really have that opportunity to gain presentation experience, which is why we don't restrict, like if you presented in October, we, we wouldn't say, well, you can't present now mid-April. Even if they want to give the identical presentation, and we encourage students to, to get that practice. But we do encourage the mentors to work with the students, if at all possible, to perhaps tweak the emphasis slightly so that it's not a complete repeat. But we wouldn't at the same time also say, no, you can't present again, because we just simply feel that when students get multiple opportunities to give presentations, even if it's the same one, they get different questions. And we have judges uh, who will judge the presentations um, so they get feedback. Uh, if they, I don't have usually time to send everyone the judges sheets, but if students ask me, um, I can send it to them, but also just interacting with the judges will give them feedback and because the judges will ask questions. But it's open to any faculty and staff and any student to attend these events. They're open to the public. Um, so there's lo usually lots of people around that will interact with the students, irrespective of whether they give an oral or poster presentation. And that's actually one more thing I should mention. The Embracing Global Engagement Conference has um, posters, short video presentations, but mostly oral presentations, mostly uh, PowerPoint presentations. 
<clears throat> the symposium on diversity <clears throat> is posters only because we're doing um, uh, course-based projects as well as outside course uh, projects for that. And then the undergraduate symposium for research and scholarship, we usually have 27 PowerPoint presentation slots and the rest are posters. And in our last incarnation before COVID hit, we had uh, over 200 posters. And so we had a total of, I think it was 228 or something like that. We just, I think, breached, the, if I remember correctly, the 200 mark. Uh, we had a lot of presentations, so over 200, well over 200. <clears throat> so it's a pretty large event. The others typically have between 40 and 50 presentations, but I would like to increase that if possible. And then when we have host a rotating one, uh, yeah, we have a lot of, of, of presentations then, then it's even bigger. <clears throat> so uh, I, I would like to just give a, mention a couple of things as advice for mentors. Being a mentor is different in different disciplines. So I understand that um, not all advice will apply to everyone, this, this, but, but most of these points are somewhat applicable at least. But I do understand that there are disciplinary differences. And I am also happy always to meet with you one on one if you want to go over what's in your dis particular discipline, what you're interested in working on and how you would like to have students participate in course. My, my first advice is if you at all can develop a cohort system, it will save you time. <clears throat> For my particular research, it lent itself very well that I would have students who have been with me for a while teach the incoming students the basics. In my case, that was how do I train a pigeon to pick a key? That's in principle a very uh, simple task um, where you can't do too much wrong. And, um, and so I would have my most senior students teach the incoming students how to do that. Uh, so this would save me time. And it would weed out already students who then would figure out, well, maybe working with animals is not my cup of tea <clears throat> because you need to have a lot of patience and you need to have an eye for detail and minute behavioral changes. So developing a cohort system can really uh, help your, your research. Uh, and it takes a few years to develop that, obviously, but it really can help you uh, get a lot done when you have more senior students uh, uh, train, at least in the basics, to incoming students. You want to start slowly and then build momentum. Obviously, you don't want to take on five students in your first semester um, unless you've had previous mentoring experience. Ensure that good communication is established with the students early on. Uh, make sure you set expectations for both sides on a timeline so everyone's on the same page. And I strongly encourage you to learn from colleagues who've had course students in your area. Uh, if you don't want to approach colleagues yourself and ask them, feel free to reach out to me and I can let you know who in your area has had CURS students before. <clears throat> I also would strongly encourage you to attend our CURS events. They will be advertised in campus updates. I also send again emails about these events uh, to uh, all faculty, <clears throat> so you'll get emails from me on those. We don't send out a lot of emails, but it's, it's, it's about the events and the grant deadlines just to keep people in the loop and aware. And I encourage you to participate as a judge because I will always call out for for faculty who are willing to fill one or several time slots as judges at these events. So you learn a lot and see a lot what other students, what other faculty do. Um, you really see a lot what's going on in terms of research and scholarly work across campus or in your area. So I strongly encourage you to participate on that level. And you can also become a course reviewer because you'll get a much deeper insight into how course applications work. <clears throat> And then I would encourage you to actively develop your mentorship and leadership skills with other um, activities, with other workshops that you might want to take. And ultimately, the best mentors are not those who micromanage and they're not those who are the ambulance of, at the bottom of the cliff. Um, you do want to be in between. You want to give students some freedom <clears throat> to have input and to develop skills and, and, and to manage themselves to some degree. But you also don't want to let them sink or swim and then just, you know, you might end up with a disaster at the end. Uh, I, I strongly would advise against that approach. Um, here are my contact details. You all have the, um, <clears throat> that, the, the PowerPoint from Kelsey. Uh, and I can always say, please f never hesitate to reach out to me. I'd be very happy to help you. And I guess at this point I come to uh, whether there are any questions that you might have. Uh, let me see. I'll stop sharing the screen. All right. I know that was a lot of information. 
um, and I appreciate you listening. And uh, I, as I said, I can't say I'm very happy to repeat this even monthly if there's enough people want to sign up. Um, so I, uh, and I'm open any questions you might have right now. We have a few minutes left. I want to be mindful of people's time. And if you don't want to ask me now, you can also uh, get in touch with me later, obviously, and reach out to me. Um, and we can have a one-on-one -on -one conversation in person or video or um, email, however you'd like to find out more, more information. So. Yeah, thank you so much, Cordula. Um, I put in the chat a link to the CFE workshop feedback form. So it should take less than, you know, two or three minutes. If those who were able to attend can open that up and provide some feedback for us. But we've also recorded this session. So it'll be on our YouTube page for reference if anyone needs to watch it again. If they have questions, Cordula did provide her information. So I will reach out and see if we want to schedule another one. But this has been very informative. So thank you guys for attending. Yeah, my pleasure. Very nice meeting you all. And I look forward to working with you, hopefully, in some capacity with you and your students. So. All right. Thank you very much. It was very Thanks. informative. Thanks. And Matt, if you have any specific questions, since you are an experienced mentor, uh, feel free to reach out to me, okay? Okay, absolutely. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Kelsey.